So it's literally like 12 hours until I'm supposed to leave on this hunt to New Brunswick, Canada, and I haven't zeroed my rifle yet. And that's actually a little bit of a lie. I uh, confirmed zero a few weeks ago with the ammunition that I used during deer season, and it was great. Uh, but I've since reached out to Lehigh Defense and Underwood Ammunition because I thought it would be an interesting uh, way to test out their Extreme Defender loadings. And what I have here is actually the Extreme Hunter round from Underwood Ammunition. If you're not familiar with Lehigh Defense, uh, they do machine bullets that use fluid dynamics to create bullet designs. And this bullet, unlike a hollow point, does not break apart inside the animal. It uses the flute technology that they have there to induce hydrostatic terminal ballistics. This is important if you read the internet because bears are touted as these super tough animals. Like they've got an air of indestructibility about them. And in my experience, that's really not the case. They're actually, I would say, quite squishy, but what the mistake that most people make is that they shoot them in the wrong place. Your point of aim on a bear is completely different than that on a deer, and people grew up most of the time shooting deer-like animals, so they shoot them in the wrong place. They either miss the vitals or they strike the shoulder girdle, and the bullet does not perform. And I have been in hunting parties before where people have shot bear with 30-30, and that same bear was spotted the next year. We got some nice helicopter action coming in, some cobras running. Gotta love it when they fly over. Uh, we're gonna keep on rolling though. What I've got here is Underwood's uh, Extreme Hunter. I have two loadings in 325 grain. One of them is the standard loading and it is rated for 2,030 feet per second. And the second one is the Plus P and it is rated for 200 or 2,275 feet per second. So what I'm gonna do is because I've got a big purple cloud bearing down on me, I've got about 10 minutes till it gets here, we're gonna shoot it on paper, see which one of these loads gets closest to my uh, previously established zero, and then we're gonna do whatever small correction we have to, and then we're gonna go back and get ready, get packed up so we can load up, get into the truck. So I'm gonna be shooting a Henry all-weather 4570 here. Uh, this has the Midwest Industries M-Lock rail on it. I'm sure that the gentleman at the border will ask me questions about the rail on my rifle. But this is one of the only guns that I have <laughs> that can cross the border into Canada. Here. Ooh, those are big shells. You can hear them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Plus P. <laughs> Much to my displeasure, you can see that the All Weather 4570 prefers <laughs> the Plus P loading. You see it rock me back. <laughs> uh, that one skipped off the side of the target. Uh, that target is angled and so slightly away. Let's go with uh, this guy down here. He's about 75. About knocked it over. Man, I tell you what, that loading is serious. Underwood, Underwood did not screw around with that plus P, that's for sure. Uh, I'm glad that I only have to shoot a few of those. Uh, but yeah, that's it. The uh, primary arms is still where I, where I put it. I think we're done here. First off, it was about a 17 hour run to our final destination. That includes pee breaks and the occasional drive-through stop. On the way there, we did it in two days, and on the way back, we did it in one, mostly because there are a few things that we wanted to see along the way. The most important stop to me was a seafood dinner along the coast of Maine. I'm a total fat kid when it comes to, well, all food, but seafood especially. The next morning we got up and went to a local site known as the Giant Stairs. Basically, it's where the ocean meets the coast and there's some interesting rock formations there. We also made an impromptu stop at the largest Paul Bunyan statue. I have no idea if it's actually the largest Paul Bunyan statue or not. 
Other than gas and food, the only other stop that we made was so that I could buy a bottle of booze on the American side before crossing the border. At the border, our truck got a thorough cavity search, holding us up for over an hour and a half at Canadian authorities. The Americans, of course, were pretty cool. By contrast, the second truck carrying the other two in our hunting party was stopped for only about 15 minutes. They just blamed it on me because, you know. Interestingly, uh, New Brunswick is on a different time zone. They are an hour ahead of what we would normally think of East Coast time. And we arrived an hour before supper with just enough time to unpack all of our equipment into our bunkhouse. That little exercise firmly cemented the importance of the thermocell devices we all brought with us, as that was our first true taste of the bug situation in the hunting area. And let me tell you what, the mosquitoes were crazy. If you would like to see a full video on the thermocell device that I used, I have two recent videos up for you, a quick overview video on the main channel and a second more in-depth video on Beyond VSO, my second channel. Links in the description box down below. If I had to guess, there were about 30 hunters at the camp for the week. I didn't get an accurate count. The layout of the camp was pretty excellent with a main lodge, cabins, shower house, motor pool, skinning shed, and multiple boat slips. The first night after dinner, we were divided up among the guides and were given a briefing on best practices, including the use of the thermocell, how to minimize detection, how to film if we wanted to, and of course, where to shoot. During the days, we were free to do whatever we cared to including sightseeing or fishing on the lake, the smallmouth bass fishing was off the chain. It's feisty. <laughs> it's a big, it's a big smallmouth. Well, if we needed to eat fish, Starting at approximately 2 to 3 p.m., the guides would pull out with the hunters, and that depended mostly on how far the run to the bait sites were. I hunted three different sites, the shortest of which was 20 minutes down the road, and the longest was over an hour ride. Let me tell you, they could really benefit from some of that toll money on those roads. Each day on the way to the stand, we would stop at their bait processing location, the idea being that it would shorten the amount of time the suspension of the vehicle had to ride with several extra hundred pounds of bait over the rough terrain. Just to give you a sense, my guide Mitchell had been baiting bear under our outfitter alone for over 20 years. Plus, I'm assuming a sizable chunk before that. He was currently managing over 50 different active sites and put several hundred miles on his vehicle every single day. Basically, the plan was to sit in two-day rotations at various sites. The idea being that the site gets visited daily by multiple bears, but they don't usually clean their plates, so to speak. If a bear wasn't seen at the bait site for the six hours that it was occupied by a hunter, it is very likely that they would see one the following night. My first and second night sits were fairly uneventful due to poor weather conditions. From talking to my guide, I've learned that bears have very acute vision, but it's a very narrow field of view. Because of this, they require supplementation from their other senses, particular smell and hearing, to tell where to look. When it's rainy or windy, those supplemental senses are dulled significantly, and they just simply refuse to move. From the first couple nights, Doc had identified a problem with his ammunition and had actually elected to change ammo to the extra that I had brought with me. There's a rim you can catch your fingernail on here on the Hornady ammunition and on the Lehigh it's more it's crimped. Yep you can see the crimp. You can see the crimp. The result is in this Henry 4570 the tube magazine is catching on there when you're trying to insert the tube mag. Yeah, push it into the push it into the actual. It's getting bound. Yeah. Yeah. Where this is you can run it right along it. And run it right around, all the way around and it slides right in. So, this is a problem. <laughs> because when you load four or five rounds in the tube mag, it's almost impossible to in insert, you know, the, uh, the tube um, spring down in, into, into the magazine and what it causes is, is you're forcing 
the chamber to open like that, causing the lifter inside the receiver to catch on the back side of the rim of the cartridge, which is causing a malfunction. So it's binding. It's binding, binding. So what I had happen is uh, when the lever was fully open, the lifter was behind the rim of the cartridge and I could not close the lever. I had to force the round the rest of the way into the chamber before I could close it. Mm. So, yeah, not a good thing when you're in bear country. No. We also found out after shooting it out of his gun that it offered an additional accuracy improvement over his other loads. On the third night, I got my first look at some bears on this trip when a few small animals came through my bait. Black bears can appear very deceptive in size, so the bait buckets are typically hung at a particular height to make this apparent. You can see, for instance, that this particular one is having difficulty getting into the bucket. This bear totally would have been legal quarry, but I chose to try for a larger specimen to go along with the one I already have. Doc had actually chosen to hunt under a different guide than us, and as a result, he was at a different location. That night, Doc got a chance at a stand that he didn't produce on the previous year, and he brought one home. Troy, one of the other guys in our hunting party, took a smaller bear that night as well. He was hunting with a 450 Bushmaster. It was really interesting to see those Lehigh bullets in action. The round gave a clean pass through and turned a large boulder into a canoe behind the animal. Doc was able to recover the projectile, and you can see that it was pretty much flawless minus the impact on the rock that bent it up a little bit. Of course, YouTube would have an absolute cow if I showed the internal organ damage. Uh, so unfortunately, you'll have to go over and watch on full 30. Uh, and if you are watching in full 30, you can see stuff. The round basically disintegrated the lungs and left a large hole bored right through the heart. Sorry if this looks like it was filmed on a potato. I ended up hunting the rest of the week without getting any good shots at bears. Uh, the largest one I saw was running from the rain, actually, uh, after it had started back up, and I had just enough time to grab the handguard of my gun before he was gone. One night, though, Mitchell had a good idea to put two semi-used buckets around some pines for my stand so that I would have an early warning that a bear was likely to come into view. Mostly because the previous night I ran out of light on a big boar bear that had just been too far up the trail to make it into sight of my bait before I had to leave. You know, because hunting regulations and stuff. I thought I had heard some activity in the area where the buckets were placed, but it didn't seem like enough to be really of any concern. I thought it was probably a squirrel. This was pretty much confirmed on my way out, seeing that the buckets were standing upright, so I grabbed them and walked to the rendezvous point. At pickup, I let him know that uh, the trick didn't really work. Uh, I heard some stuff, but both buckets were standing up, untouched. He remarked, standing up, eh? Well, I'll have you know that the buckets were both laying down when I left them. This means that the bear literally came within 40 feet of me, and I barely detected it. Although that night we both had close calls uh, because he had a visit from a bear trying to get into the bait mobile at the primary rendezvous point. Usually he has 30 to 40 minutes of downtime uh, between the end of the baiting cycle and pickup for all of his hunters. In that time, a bear decided it wanted to get into the vehicle with him in it. He was able to get a few low res pictures on his phone uh, that I failed to get from him just because he knew that nobody would believe that the bear tried to get into the vehicle with him. All in all, it was an awesome trip and frankly, I needed it. I needed to get away and press the reset button. Although while I was there, I did take an opportunity to visit the local decommissioned train station and a fairly sizable gun shop in McAdam while I was there. It was made even more cool because while I was pointing out some features that somebody asked me about the uh, 50 caliber rifle that was laying on the counter, a fellow gun tuber picked me out from within the store. I talked with him and the shop manager for about 30 minutes and decided that because I couldn't buy a weapon there, I would support the shop by picking up a flashlight. Deep breath, 511 something or other. If you're interested in more info on this light, let me know, and maybe I'll do a gadgetry video on it later. If you'd like any more information on the lightweight clothing that I used that proved to be mosquito proof, I have links to the Sportsman's Guide product pages in the description box, as well as an affiliate code that can help us both out. Thanks for joining me for the recap of my hunting trip. I hope that you had as good a time watching it as I had making it. Be sure to let me know what you think in the comments down below. Next week, back to guns wholesale.